All right. So I'm Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester and host of the Forest Connect webinar series. And it's my pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Ralph Nyland. Ralph has given several webinars over the past several years, and they've always been extremely well attended and extremely well done. As you can imagine, most of you, I think, either know Ralph or know of Ralph, and so none of that comes as a surprise. And uh, Ralph has recently retired from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and will be joining us tonight to talk about controlling thinning, some concepts and methods. So with that, Ralph, I'm going to mute my microphone, and the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Welcome to the first day of summer, or the waning part of it, and I hope by this time all that snow is melted in Hawaii. Let's think about three basic things tonight. And the first is how much stocking to leave behind when you thin or reduce the density of even age stands. And my, my focus tonight is totally on even aged stands. And secondly, when you reduce density by thinning or other intermediate treatments, what trees do you favor? That's a very important part of it. And thirdly, how do you make it all work? What can we do on the ground? What methods can we use? What prescription technique can we use to pull it all together? I want to focus on wood production as a basis here tonight, but remember we use thinning for a variety of other purposes as well. Many other ecosystem services such as changing the visual qualities, reducing uh, obstructions in public use areas, uh, affecting the habitat for wild creatures. So we're just focusing here on wood production, remembering that we do other things with thinning as well. And let's start by uh, working through some concepts that I think illuminate our understanding of thinning and facilitate the prescription making that we'll do before we go into the woods to start marking trees. So here are the questions we need to ask at the start about stocking and production. How, do, how does residual stocking affect production after treatment? And what does that indicate about thing intensity? The, the relationships be, uh, between residual density and production were first elucidated by Longsather in, in Scandinavia in a publication in 1941. And he used this graph to illustrate the hypothesis. The vertical axis is net volume growth, the change in cubic feet per hectare. And the horizontal axis is the basal area left behind. So basal area increases from left to right. So on the right-hand side, the very right-hand side, we have fully stocked unthin stands. Now his curves all relate to production or net change and production as I'm using it tonight means accretion plus ingrowth less mortality. So Longshatter uh, separated the his hypothesis into five zones here. In the first zone uh, if you think about starting at the left with no basal area and then increase go from plot to plot and increase by a little bit by a little bit a little bit Production is increasing rapidly in a quite a linear fashion. So every tree you add or leave behind increases production to an important degree, a noticeable degree. When you reach zone two with stocking, then we begin to see some intertree competition. And as that in intertree competition increases, the addition by growth on an individual tree begins to increase or decrease, and hence the volume increases at a slower rate. And then when you get to zone three, there's a big plateau here with essentially similar levels of production from the left to the right-hand side of zone three. So it's steady through this range of stocking. In zone four, intertree competition has increased to the point that you see a drop-off in net accumulation, the mortality is increasing, 
individual tree growth is slowing. And then in zone five, that production dropped precipitously because of the high levels of mortality, the slow growth of the trees. So that's Langstatter's uh, hypothesis from 1941. In 1954, Marmor, uh, working out of Denmark and using data from Germany and Denmark, presented his hypotheses in this form. Now, if you look at these two diagrams, Langstatter in the upper left had basal area stocking going from zero on the left to 100% on the right. But Marmoller has zero on the right and high on the left. So he, in a sense, he flipped the axes. So here's, here's uh, Marmoller's hypothesis. You notice he had no data for the very low ends of the scale, 30% of maximum or less. And I suspect he was hypothesizing that based upon Langstetter. But notice that uh, between about 30 and 50 or so, he's showing that slow increase with every new element or unit of basal area, just as we saw in zone two of Langstetter. And now, uh, in this case, Marmoller is representing gross growth. So it's accretion plus ingrowth, and he did not account for mortality. Or at least he, what he did was to measure the dead trees by, at frequent intervals and add them back in. So he has gross growth. And notice from about 60% of the maximum stock, up to 100, the gross growth is essentially similar. It's not exactly the same, but it's essentially similar. And you couldn't separate them statistically, one plot from another. So there's an important plateau that, that between about 60% of the maximum that you could have at a site and 100% of the maximum you could have, you're getting equivalent amounts of potential growth in gross measure, in gross measure. So that's that critical uh, plateau for residual stocking. It suggests and tells us the fact that stands are fully occupying the site, at least for production. They fully capture incoming solar energy and convert that to biomass at the maximum possible level. And they fix biomass at the fullest possible level because of that in, within the period of the thinning cycle. And generally we're talking about thinning cycles that are at least 10 years and, and upwards to about 15 years. Now this seems to work with one caveat. You have to keep the right kinds of trees. If you don't keep the right kinds of trees, this falls apart. Now here's a little explanation that uh, Martin Dale developed from his work with uh, oaks in the, in the central states. He pointed out that uh, as he measured both gross and net growth, again by frequent measuring, he could, he could find out what was dying. He showed that somewhere around 80%, you began to see important amounts of losses to mortality. And in fact, when he got it up to about 100%, the, the gross growth could be reduced by as much as uh, 45%. Uh, so net growth would be just a little bit more than half of the gross growth at these very high levels of residual stocking. Here's a the real data that Martin Dale put together. If you look at the upper curves, they're a little bit clearer because he had a full range of data. And you see the upper solid line, that's the 100% or the gross growth line. And the dashed line is the net growth line. Curves C and D show the same pattern, but he had no data for stocking below about 45 to 50%. This came from uh, Steniker and Jarvis. It applies to aspen stands. And I recognize that not very many people thin aspen, but you see the pattern of growth here. They're, they're finding a plateau that's recurring somewhere around 60%, up to 100 where you get similar gross growth, but with net growth plummeting above, uh, especially above 80%. Now the, the, I'm sorry, that's, that's my telephone ring. Uh, the, the key here is that we want to then keep trees in that green zone, keep it between 60 and 80% to optimize the production that we would have within a stand. And I'll call it the green zone. 
But the question then comes, how do we set the bounds for the green zone? How do we know what represents 60% of relative density and what represents 80% so we can, in fact, do something more than guess at it? Well, there we turn to the stocking guides, and, and many of you have seen this form. It comes from Roach and Gingrich for what they called upland central hardwoods, essentially mid upland uh, oak stands, mixed hard, much oak stands. You will find stocking guides of this form and of other configurations for many forest community types around eastern North America and also for some of the west coast uh, mixed conifer stands. So let's examine this. The, the vertical line represents an uh, increase in basal area within the stand, and hence as the basal area increases from bottom to top, the stand is aging. They use numbers of trees per acre as a surrogate for stand age. So stands age from right to left, high numbers of trees at early ages, low numbers of trees at old ages. And on that curve, you see a bunch of lines. The top one is the A line, 100% relative density. They called it A. That's set at the maximum for the site. And you notice that the, the stand will grow from right to left. So as the stand ages, the amount of basal area within the stand is increasing. And they set a B line. Now in, in their oak data, they found that that threshold at the bottom would, would be set somewhere around 57 or 58 percent relative density. And the idea is that at that level of relative density, you would have full site utilization with upland central hardwoods. Again, you'd need a different stocking guide for each community type. So here's the, here's the green zone. You start at the upper right with a stand that's not been thinned, and you reduce it down. Now, in any one thinning, you should never take out more than 35% relative density. So they don't quite go down to the B line in the first entry. They let the thing grow up to the 80% line, marked in purple, and then thin it back to the B line and let it grow up to the 80% line and balance the stand between these two levels of stocking. That is, in fact, a transformed version of the standard production function. And here's the standard production function with basal area or volume on the vertical axis increasing from bottom to top. And in the production function, time goes from left to right, from left to right. So the solid line is the amount of volume you'd sign standing at any point in time in an unthinned stand. The sawtooth pattern shows the thinning uh, regime, reduced to 60%, grown to 80, reduced to 60, grown to 80. And notice that the, this between both the 60 and 80 lines have a positive upward slope, a positive upward slope. And the 60% line, the baseler increases through time. That's an important concept. That if you look at the B line, the amount of residual basal area to ensure full site utilization increases with each entry to a stand. I, when I was starting out, uh, we would go out and even age stands, but then, uh, and Fred would say to me, Ralph, uh, how much should we leave the next time? I was right out of college, allegedly, I just knew everything. I'd say, I don't know, but Bob was with us. I'd, Bob, uh, what would you do? And he said, I don't know. And the other, he'd say to the other Bob, Bob, what would you do? And, and Bob would say to Fred, Fred, what do you think? And we'd go around in circles and no one knew. At that time, we were thinning everything in northern hardwoods to about 90 square feet of base area. Now we know. Now we know that the next time we're going to be more and then more and then more, and we can determine the amount by reference to the B line. So there's our production function with that residual basal area increasing with each entry to the stand. And if we do that, then the, then the uh, sawtooth production function has an upward positive slope. If we had continued thinning everything to the same basal area, that curve would not only become horizontal, but it would begin decreasing through time. So the key here is that you enter 60% relative density, and that will mean you'll be leaving basal area more and more and more each time you enter. So there's the hypothesis that uh, in this generalized form, the one at the top, 
comes from Helms, Daniel, and Baker. And you see their threshold of, of well spaced is in that centered around that 60% minimum. And at the bottom is the Langsatter hypothesis and the and zone three, we would now suggest is bounded on the left by 60% relative density and on the right by 80% or thereabouts. Now there is one bit of evidence that we need to keep watching. Uh, Marcus uh, reported on this, and there have been some hints from others. In, in fact, uh, as Bill Lee began to modify his stocking guide through time, he pushed his beeline up a little bit, perhaps around 70%. Marcus found that in older stands, where you have essentially the volume and board foot volume, larger trees, that if you any reduction in base layer below about 80%, Reduce, reduces uh, the production that comes. And I think it probably is a result that in saw timber sized trees, when you take out a tree, you leave a big hole. Lateral branch expansion is slow, doesn't fill the space so much. And when you have empty space, you don't have production. You have nothing intercepting incoming solar energy. So, so you want to keep that face filled, filled or at least keep it filled enough so that by the end of the cutting cycle, a thinning interval, it is filled up again and you're getting that full site utilization. Keep your eye on this. It needs further definition in my judgment. So that, that's about the story for a stand as summarized in the top part of this, but what about for an individual tree? And here, if we go back to Helms, Daniel and Baker, they have marked the threshold for full or maximum growth of individual trees at about 30 to 35 percent relative density. So there's a plateau here from one tree in the stand to up to about 35 percent of relative density, you would have fairly constant individual tree growth. Rapid growth at the maximum. You remember, you remember the, the hypothesis that as you in that zone one, you see every additional amount of base layer you leave results in a rapid increase. It's because the increased growth, the rapid growth of the trees you have there are compensating for the growth that would have been present, pr produced at higher levels. So here's that threshold then for individual tree growth set at about 30 to 35% by Helms, Daniel, and Baker. And, and if you go back then to Langsatter, he had a second diagram, and this is the hypothesis for individual tree growth. With individual tree growth, the max percent of maximum on the vertical axis and base layer per hectare on the horizontal axis. And, and you see he's got that zone number one where uh, over a wide range of stocking, growth of the tree is not affected. When you get to zone two, we're beginning to see intertree competition. We're beginning to see individual tree growth slow that continues through zone three and it really drops extremely rapidly in the latter part of zone four and down in zone five. So what we're depending on here, we know that we're gonna reduce the stocking down to this 60% threshold with the assurance or the confidence that we should get full net production. It's because we have increased individual tree growth compared to an unthin stand. And we have to decide then if that's what we want, we want full net production, we increase tree growth to the, to the bottom of zone three. If you really want to maximize individual tree growth independent of production per acre, then you have to drop it down to these lower levels. You will lose production per acre, but have much more rapid individual tree growth. And there's the, the same story in the data that Marcus gathered for Allegheny hardwoods. The individual tree growth maximized from about 30% of relative density down to zero, and the stand production maximized at 60% to, to upwards to 80%. So they're the two hypotheses of Langstadter and the data we have presented to us from various sources since that time seems to uh, support this notion. Even now, in fact, setting zones on the lower, the bounds on the lower and upper areas of zone three. Well, let's look at some other tree responses and, and what they may indicate about uh, the thinning strategy that we want to develop. 
Did you notice these two bottom curves in the, in the Marquis uh, diagram? The red one shows basal area mortality and, and it continues to increase. Uh, but notice the bottom curve in yellow or orangish yellow. It, at low levels of stocking, you get very little volume growth. This is board foot volume. <clears throat> notice here, uh, as he uh, developed that a little bit more, You've got three different lines. The, the dotted line is for trees of overtop positions that are suppressed. They're truly suppressed because they're dying. The dashed line in the middle is for intermediate trees, trees of intermediate crown positions. And the solid line is for the overtop trees, dominance and the, excuse me, for the dominance and codominance. Notice that the mortality up to about 80% is largely with the overtopped and intermediate trees. The trees that have limited volume per tree, the trees that have marginal quality per tree, at least in hardwoods. And you begin losing saw timber production when you get above that 80% threshold. So it sort of gives us a, a, a confidence that the 80% is as meaningful a suggestion for the present as, as is the 60% uh, for the lower level stocking. Here's one other thing from Marquis. He looked at the development of epicormic branches on residual trees. And he found that as you reduce stocking down to about 60% in Allegheny hardwoods, there were very few epicormic branches. For plots below 60%, the, the number of epicormics increased dramatically with each reduction in stocking. The, in my judgment, my experience anyway, the epicormics mostly come from trees of subordinate crown positions, the trees of low vigor, that when you open them up, you get a response that includes epicormic branches. And usually, if you go into stands, uh, hardwood stands, you can see what trees will develop epicormics because they're obvious, often obvious on the stems of the trees. And I think that's particularly true with oaks, but you can see it in, in sugar maple as well. So 60%, gives us full net production and also helps to minimize epicormic branching on hardwood trees. So there we have a whole bunch of evidence which is supporting this idea of reducing stock in 60%, letting stand regrow to 80%, thinning it back is in, the green zone represented by those two levels of stock. And now back to the standard production function with volume increasing on the vertical axis, stand age increasing from left to right on the horizontal axis. And the, the dash line in the middle is what we would see in the stand at any stage of development. We know that at some point we begin to lose important volume by mortality. And if we had counted that and put it in cumulative uh, volume, uh, the gross growth would be represented by the dash line above that. So, Part of the concept of thinning is we try to get into these stands before we lose valuable tree, harvest the potential mortality and put it in the marketplace. And that would increase the realized volume for the period of a rotation. For thin stands, we work on the sawtooth production function with the positive upward slope with increased basal area each time. And the, the area between the dash line and the solid line those are the excess trees we don't need in order to maintain full production. Those are the trees in excess of the 60% line. Now, given that, what trees do you favor? And this is an absolutely important question. This is critical, as critical in fact as regulating stock. We know from looking at even age stands for time, and, and many people have uh, discussed this, that trees differentiate into crown positions by virtue of their sizes. The dominants are the uppermost and the overtop trees are the lowermost. And there is a relationship between crown position, tree diameter, crown position, and potential growth upon release. In fact, growth before release. The, the earliest uh, representation of this that I, have been exposed to, or at least can remember right now, is is a uh, in the book on forest yield studies by Osman from the German literature, translated into English in 1970. 
So he's representing by the outer circle, the boxes on the outer circle, three main factors that influence tree growth and, and phenotype, including the growth. One is the climate, uh, the length of the growing season is one factor. The longer the growing season, the, the greater potential for adding wood volume per tree. The soils, there is an effect of, of site quality on growth, height, but also perhaps probably on volume. There is and certainly on volume. And the other one is the position of the tree, the crown position. And, and he, he puts the arrow back down to the center which is the genotype, uh, the, the, the genetic makeup of the tree. And the idea here is that the trees that are best suited to growing on the combination of climate and soil at a particular site will grow the best. Those will end up in upper canopy positions and the trees that are less well suited genetically for one reason or another will end up in subordinate positions because they just don't grow that well. Osman, in another part of his book, presents this diagram. The vertical axis is volume increment in meters cubed per tree. And the, the horizontal axis is the crown canopy area of the tree, the size of, of, the, of the crown in square meters. So he's representing uh, different crown classes. Now the craft system uses six four of them, one through four, and then these two uh, that are listed with names that I can't translate, but that's okay. So the best trees of the best crown position are shown in green, and those are at the top. And as you move down from the upper line to the next, to the next, to the next, you're moving from the dominance to the co-dominance, the intermediate, the overtop, to whatever these other classes are. And you notice that the, the trees that are producing the most are the ones with the largest crowns and they happen to be in the upper crown positions, upper canopy positions, the dominance and upper co dominance. Back in uh, 1985, John LaRue measured sugar maple trees in some thinning plots at Monokina, New York, in the Adirondacks. And he found this relationship diameter growth is on the vertical axis, DBH is on the horizontal axis, so the big trees are on the right. And you notice the the small trees go much less after thinning than the big trees, even aged stands. He, he also checked uh, crown position and, and related that to growth. And John found that crown position was redundant with tree diameter when trying to estimate the growth potential. So it gives us the confidence then that we can use tree diameter as an indicator of how trees will grow in even aged stands both before and after thinning. The big trees will grow well, the small trees will not grow well. Here's some data. We went back uh, to the same plots as the rue and measured them after 15 years and the average 15 year growth on the dominant trees was about three inches. The co-dominance just under two inches. The intermediates an inch and a third and the overtop trees two thirds of an inch. Once a runt always around, just like pigs. Trees of small size in even age stands and of subordinate canopy positions just do not grow well after thinning. If you want to maximize tree growth, you've got to keep the dominance and the upper co-dominance. Marcus has some similar data. Uh, he represents here the growth of co-dominant, intermediate, and overtop trees as a percentage of the growth that he measured on dominance. And notice that he has uh, three time intervals. In, in all cases, as you drop from the upper to the next, to the next, to the lowest crown position, the growth decreases a portion of what you can get on dominant trees. So that in his case, the, this is an unthinned stand. The co-dominants are about two-thirds of what you get on the dominance. These are our data uh, from 70 to 75 year old stands after, after a 15 year period, 25, 15 year period. And in thin stands, thin to B level roller density, it's very similar pattern. A little bit better growth in the thin stands than in the unthin stands. So we've stimulated the growth. The co-dominants are still at about two-thirds of the dominance. 
the intermediates at half the rate and the over tops at only about a, 20, a quarter to a fifth of the rate of the dominant trees. So keep the big trees. Cutting the adjacent small ones around them to release the crowns, to, to add sunlight around the lower parts of the crowns of the dominants and the co-dominant trees, that will result in better growth. Favorite the dominants and the co-dominants. These trees, the ones of upper canopy positions, the ones of largest diameter, and at well spacing, a uniform spacing, so that you've got the full canopy coverage, you get uh, full stocking as the stand develops. Okay, given that, how does all this fit into the different recognized methods of fittings that have historically been, been talked about? Let's, let's think of only a couple of them. And, and one is called thinning from below. Thinning from below is simply moving the smallest trees from the stand and leaving the bigger ones behind. I want to use this type of diagram to depict the diameter distribution of a stand before and what we would take out now. Let's dispel a myth here for a minute. In the, early, I was taught that even age stands had bell-shaped diameter distributions. And, and I got out of the college and went to work and started measuring stands and found they didn't at all. That stands with an important shade tolerant component the small trees survive and stay alive for decades, growing very slowly. But it results in a more reverse J kind of diameter distribution in stands that have an important shade tolerant component or in stands that have, that have a mixture of species that grow at different rates. So I'm going to use the, uh, yeah, I'm going to use this diameter distribution curve um, somewhat of a reverse J to represent the unthin stand. And across that area shows what we would take out by a thinning from below. It's essentially all the small trees. Historically, civil cultures have recognized four grades of thinning from below. Uh, in, in A, you take out only the overtop trees, and B, the overtops and intermediates, and C, overtops, intermediates, and some codominants, and in D, you're really working heavily into the heavy into the upper crown canopy by taking even most of the codominants, or at least many of them. But if we want to intrude into the main canopy, if we want to release the crowns of the uppermost canopy trees, the largest trees, then we have to consider at least a C or D grade thinning from below. And of the two, a D grade thinning is very heavy. Probably it would drop the stand below 60% relative density. So if you're guiding in on this relative density approach for controlling thinning, you probably would use a C-grade thinning from below if you use a thinning from below. So the C-grade thinning from below would then cut all the overtopped, all the intermediates, and some of the codominants. And if you, if, you, if you make it moderate, it's going to stay within 60% relative density. At least I've been able to calculate doing these kinds of thinnings and ending up with 60% relative density. All right, let's, let's use this as a representation of a stand and, and take advantage of some animation that Roger Nissen did for me. So there's our even age stand. You notice a tree of different sizes of different canopy positions. And we want to thin that from below C grade. Those are the ones we take out, all the overtop, all the intermediates, and some of the codominants. It, it will have an effect upon the upper canopy by releasing the crowns of some trees. Okay, there it is. Uh, everything's gone from beneath. Now those, those small trees don't affect the growth of the residuals, except on dry sites like in some of the oak community. But it has in fact opened up the crown canopy and, and should favor the growth of the trees that remain, at least to an important degree. But you must cut the small trees. And that presents a challenge to many of us. Finding a market for these small trees if you have a biomass market with mechanized harvesting, that's often possible to take them out and use them to help supplement the cost of the thinning, or you make an investment. 
So in many cases where we don't have this market, uh, unless we have a special purpose in mind for using a, a thinning from below, such as wanting to clean out the understory to enhance understory visibility or take away obstruction to people walking or something like that, we would probably find this difficult to implement with a landowner who wasn't willing to invest several amounts of money in cutting small trees. So a crown thinning often works better for us under these circumstances. And a crown thinning is really an effort to reduce crowding within the main canopy layer. It easily fits within the idea of keeping 60% relative density, letting regrow to 80, and it will enhance the growth of trees in upper canopy positions, the dominance and the, and the co-dominance. So here's the diagram again. If we, if we uh, go back to the, the publications of Mark Research and Stout for Allegheny Hardwoods, uh, they, they define what they call a commercial thinning as taking one third of the cut from above the DM and two thirds below. They define DM as the midpoint in the distribution of base layer. That's really what a crown thinning does. Most of the cut is coming below that, that middle point or basilar distribution and a little bit above. You have to include within the main crown canopy in order to get the effect that you want. But you don't cut all the small trees. They're not affecting the growth of trees in upper canopy positions except in very droughty sites. So here we are again. And let's let's do a crown thinning. Let's mark it first. So you see here's the overtop trees left behind. Some of the intermediates left behind. We're really focusing on what trees within the main canopy are affecting the growth of the best we have. And that's the key. We're going to pick out the best we have at fairly regular intervals so we get a good uniform distribution of foliage in the residual stand. There we are, crown thinning. Now, one of the non-market benefits of this uh, there are some songbirds that operate very close to the ground, and there are some that operate at mid canopy levels, and others operate in the main canopy. If you do a thinning from below, you're essentially taking out that lower habitat component for those gills of birds. In this case, you've left at least a modicum of that, so you would not entirely lose that, that uh, component of the uh, songbird diversity. There are other things that would use those those uh, short trees too so it does have that non-market value to it but it opens up the crowns of the main canopy trees it illuminates the foliage they begin to grow and in northern hardwoods you will see a growth response in sugar maple in the first year after thinning so there's the stand this is a 70 to 75 year old northern hardwood stand prior to thinning never been thinned before and that's what it looks like after very dense canopy cover before, lots of crowding trees, a lot of vertical distribution of foliage. And here in the crown thinning, we've opened up the crowns around selected trees, the best we have of the largest diameters at fairly uniform spacing. And on the ground, it would look like that. Notice the fairly uniform spacing. Uh, and notice the, uh, there is a diversity of sizes, but we've put most of the, larger size classes on those biggest trees in the stand. We have some fairly recent 25 year old growth data from uh, thin northern hardwood stands in the Adirondacks of New York. And uh, David Schmidt did this work. The, the vertical axis represents the predicted increment in diameter. And it goes from bottom to top, increases that way. Time increases from left to right. Uh, up to a 25 year period. And so we want to ask the questions, uh, is the growth related to tree size? Does the diameter reflect crown position? We, we already have confirmation of the latter. So what about the, the size of the trees? We've cast these, uh, these growth curves in, in a little different form than we saw earlier. So the, uh, these are set of curves for trees of different diameters. The left-hand column are, shows the growth of eight-inch trees. The right-hand column, growth of a 20-inch tree. 
and the in between that are 12 and 16 inch trees, all from the same even aged stand. And you notice that if you look at the top part of the curve in each case, that upper part of the curve is increased higher and higher as we get to the bigger trees. Within each column, there's a separate curve for stands at 40, 60, 80, and 100% relative density. And it would show that the lower the density, the better the growth. Here's, here's a set of curves that, that focuses on plot relative density. And uh, with the 40% relative density on the left, the 60, the 800% on the right, the 60 and 80 in the middle. So it's the, it's a 60% line that we're really are, are using as our residual. You notice in all these cases, the bigger trees grow the best, the trees, the bigger trees, or any size tree at lower densities grow better than at higher densities. There's another thing we see in these things. If you, you see the, the right-hand side of those curves, then the, the spread in the growth rate increases with time for, for plot relative density and for tree diameter. So the benefit of leaving the larger diameter trees is, is increased with as the longer the cutting cycle you have. In the early parts of the, year of the cycle, you won't see much difference. As you get towards the end of the interval, you will begin to see more and more difference between in the growth between the big and the small trees in your stand. So we want to favor trees of upper canopy positions, and we want to thin around them at appropriate level so that we're illuminating the crowns and getting growth. We want to go from this condition in the unthin stand to something like this for the thin stand regulated to 60% relative density with crown thinning. Well, let's look at an ugly alternative. And in forestry, we seem to find these quite frequently. <clears throat> And that's a diameter limit cutting. Now, in the historic literature, you, you, you do find a method of thinning called selection thinning, which takes out the big trees to favor what they say is promising ones of smaller sizes. It's really a diameter limit cutting. It takes trees from the upper end of the diameter distribution. So let's go back to this again. There's the trees we would select for first entry. And it's the big trees, leaving the small ones behind. In, in commonly what I see in northern hardwoods, and I think in oaks too, is they would set the minimum threshold at the minimum saw timber size for a tree. For us, it's 12 inches. That's what it would look like. This was a fully stocked, 100% relative density, northern hardwood stand prior to thinning. Note the patchiness, but also Note that the trees left behind, the ones in subordinate canopy positions, have poor quality. They're just not good trees. That's the result of a diameter limit cut or a selective cut in this even age stand. And that's what it looks like patchy, poor quality trees left behind, at least compared to quality that was taken out with the diameter limit cutting. Now, remember John LaRue? It's the trees in purple we're leaving behind and the trees in blue we're taking away. We are sacrificing growth potential. We're sacrificing production potential by diameter limit cutting. So here are the growth values again for 15 years. The intermediates may grow an inch and a third, the overtop two thirds of an inch. The runts, once a runt, always a runt, remember that? We've sacrificed a change of nearly three inches and a change of nearly two inches by taking out those upper canopy trees of good genetic potential to grow well to the side and have good quality. Now, you, you saw in the, in the growth curves from Schmidt that uh, all of these trees, even the, the ones in subordinate positions, will increase in diameter through time. The crowns will expand because they've been exposed to light. And at some point, uh, you may want to come in and do another diameter limit cut. It's not likely you'll, you'll find as much volume this time because the, the trees haven't grown very well, but let's do another diameter limit cut in the stand. 
it is fairly well broken, isn't it? In fact, uh, it's hard to find the potential in a stand that's had two diamond limit cuts. And, and what I've witnessed is that after three di after the third entry, which is largely for pulpwood and, and biomass, it's just a quandary what to do next. It is ugly. It is ugly. So if you cut the large trees and keep the small ones, you can't expect good growth or good production. Let's look at two scenarios, just to illustrate this. One, we're going to thin and then thin and then regenerate over a, over a rotation using uh, crown thinning. In the other, we'll do three diamond limit cuts. Uh, in, the, in the diamond limit cutting, we'll take all trees 12 inches and bigger at each occasion. And we'll use the, this is the Benjamin Roach stocking guide for Allegheny hardwoods. We're gonna use that to control the thinning he has a series of A-level lines, each set for a different proportion of cherry, ash, and tulip poplar within the stand. So we're going to use for this illustration 0% cherry, ash, and tulip poplar, essentially sugar maple stand, and we're going to cut it to the lowest B line, which is the one for it. So it goes down, take out 35%, we let it regrow to 80%, down to 60%, B line up to 80%. And at that point, then we would regenerate the next time. Here are the heights that I've used, international quarter inch volume for trees 12 inches and bigger. And uh, you notice that uh, 16 inches and bigger, we just don't see much change in merchable height because of the ice and snow damage that's uh, so prevalent at the high latitudes. There are the three stands. <clears throat> They're similar. In average diameter, the middle stand has a little bit more basal area. They're all somewhere around close to 100% relative density. This is in these measures of trees one inch and bigger. <clears throat> so let's do this. Let's watch how these different scenarios, these diameter limit cutting or crown thinning, affect the, the series of entries beginning at age 63 and ending with a rotation age of 113 and looks at the degree of similarity or difference, not too much, too much worrying about the absolute values, because they will differ from site to site depending on tree heights and things like that. But let's look at the relative differences between them. The, the data show in tables like this, the left column, the first, second, third entry, and then the total yields. The middle is the diamond limit, treatment, the amount cut in board feed and the amount left behind. And of course, we're not leaving any sodium. And the right-hand columns are the, the crown thinning, the, what we take out in board feed and what we leave behind uh, each time. The, the zero at the bottom is where we regenerate by an even age method. Notice in the crown thinnings, we're getting some pulpwood volume because we're moving down to do some removals in the smaller crown classes. Here's scenario number two. Like the first, in this case, we got 13,000 board feet from diamond cut, 16,000 out of ground thinning. And scenario stand three, 11, three out of diamond cutting, 14 out of ground thinning. So there they are. Uh, the differences are less magnificent in, in stand two and most uh, the greatest difference in stand one. But look at what happens if you enumerate the volume in trees at least 16 inches in diameter. 70 to 75 percent of the volume comes out of those size trees in the thin stands, and only say 10 to 15 percent of the volume in the, of those sizes in the diameter of the cut. And why is that important? Because if you use the standard U.S. Forest Service tree grades for hardwoods. Uh, about two thirds of the volume in a 16 inch and bigger tree, if it's grade one, will, will give you one common and better lumber. And that's the lumber that the sawmills make money on. They lose money on, on the two and three common lumber. So if you have trees that are going to be reaching that 16 inch threshold and you're focused on leaving the best trees in each time, you come to the, as the rotation progresses, you're getting out better and better trees and you end up with these high levels of of yield in large diameter, high quality trees. Well, there is the effect on the diameter distribution. The top is crown thinning. The little bars in the middle are marks of 16 inch threshold. 
So you see as you go from left to right how the, the numbers per acre, 16 inches in beer, just increases through time. And at the bottom, we never are leaving trees over 12 inches, and we just don't get trees up to 16 inches because of the slow growth of the trees we leave behind. So it's your choice. Uh, we can do crown thinning and promote growth and development through time and high levels of production and good value, or we can extract value at the first entry and ravage the stand in a sense. So your choice for better or for worse. Uh, I I'm, I'm have sent to Peter some tools that you might be able to use uh, in planning a thinning, and they follow the procedures that have been proposed by Mark Research and Stout. Uh, there's an Excel worksheet that allows you to calculate the relative density very quickly and make a thinning. Now, Mark Research and Stout have a thing called SILVA, which is a very good program, but it, it it's much more does much more than just uh, allow you to program a thinning. We've reduced it to just the thinning part using their relative density practice. And then we'll send you a PDF file that, that explains how to use the Excel worksheet and a, a sample data set that uh, you can practice with. So I said contact Peter, but uh, Peter earlier in the day said, look, he'll just send it to everyone that, uh, when this is over, probably next week maybe. So if you want to check some references, at the end uh, you will find uh, a list of the people that I've drawn upon, uh, and also uh, again to acknowledge Roger Nissen's work to animate those cartoons. That's it. Very good, Ralph. Thank you. So, um, so I, I've, I'll start with the first question, and those of you who are uh, participating, please. This is your chance to to type in questions. Please feel free to do that. And I'll I'll read the question. I'll read the read the questions to Ralph, and then he'll respond to those. So, Ralph, I'm curious about. I think it was Schmidt that did the work with the sugar maple stands in Wanakina, and he was looking at the the growth responses over the cutting cycle, and um, in, in in any one set of graphs, there was a you know, between any two um, adjacent lines, and you, you pointed this out, that as time goes on, the differential between those two lines um, increases. Yeah, let me see if I can find that quickly. Uh, this would be kind of sloppy, but let's see if I can come to it. There they are. Yep. All right, there's, there's the one for diameter growth. Right, so it, any of those. Why does that... Why does the differential increase through time? I mean, why that suggests that that they're starting at the same point. I guess they yes. are because they're, there's, it's maybe in an unthin stand. Yeah. But then, it, why does it ex, is so? Is it that the bigger trees are gaining faster, or yes. that the, the smaller yes. trees are slowing down faster? Right, and and probably the lower diagram shows it. This one shows individual tree growth at different levels of relative density, and you see the splaying out of those curves with time. So the, <clears throat> the, the, the small trees are growing better, there's no question about it, but at a slower rate. And the big trees are growing better at a much faster rate, and so the, the differential between them increases through time. So is it an, is it an accumulated advantage that yes. the bigger trees have? Yes, it's accumulating, accumulating advantage because of, of growth rate. I, it, 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 it probably, uh, as the crown canopy closes, we, we know that the growth of an injury trees begins to slow. Langstadter showed us that. Um, so this is the, this is the, uh, the yeah, cumulative, the, the change in diameter, perhaps we ought to be talking about more than the growth rate. The change in diameter results in a greater difference in the endpoint diameter of the trees at different crown positions or different diameters. I guess the, the bigger trees are going to have more, a greater share of the of the canopy. Yeah, more leaves, yes. And 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 so it's a almost a, they're displacing. They they have a well. Let's state the obvious: a competitive advantage. Well, you know, if you go back to to uh, Osman and <clears throat> and some stuff that's been done by folks at the University of Mont, De Hayes and that group, 
there is a genetic uh, element here that uh, the trees of subordinate compositions are just don't have the genetic makeup for as rapid good growth as the trees of upper composition. So it 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 has to do with the genetic constitution uh, as much as anything. They are somewhat shaded by the the upper canopy trees, and that probably also makes a difference. Right, and they're, inc- I guess what I was saying, they're increasingly shaded over time. Yes, through, through the cutting cycle, the thinning interval, <clears throat> as the upper canopy closes, the shade of the trees in subordinate positions increases. That's right. So, okay, that make, now that makes sense. Thank you. All That's right, good. Useful. So we have some questions to start with from Carl. He has a series of questions. Um, they relate mostly to the concept of sustainable forest management and the use of tree diameter as a tool or a guide um, to result in good sustainable forest management. Well, um, <clears throat> for even eight stands, you can't, if you think of the diameter limit cut examples, you just can't sustain that through time. And when you come to the end of whatever, you, the stands are so badly ravaged, you need to replace them. You don't have much of a seed source. And it probably is made up of trees of poor genetic quality. So that's not sustainable. If you do crown thinning, favoring good trees, then you, you come to the end of rotation, you have high quality trees of high vigor that produce a lot of seed. And if you use the appropriate regeneration method, you should be able to start a new stand. If, if you're into uh, that kind of a scenario. If you have uneven age stands, we can talk about that, but if you have uneven age stands, you, can, you still have to favor the best of each age class, and then you can sustain those through time. So, you know, sustainable management requires an investment of time. And, and you, have to, you have to think about the future. The, the Iroquois here in New York, and, and I've learned that this was true of Native Americans all up into Nova Scotia, even. they had the basic concept that, that when you do something, you have to think seven generations into the future. And if what you do would not make things available and good for seven generations in the future, you ought not to do it. So I, I see that diameter limit cutting is thinking about me right now. And crown thinning, using that in a, in a proper uh, regime is, is thinking about the future because you're you're getting benefits now but you're leaving the potential to regenerate and provide benefits into the future i'm not sure if that really addresses your question but hopefully it speaks I, I, to it i think it does so there's a another question that i'll, I'll modify a little bit and, it, and it, it's looking at um maybe the how how the appropriate use, how the appropriate use of good thinning practices um, prepares you for the regeneration phase, whether it's a, a clear cutting system or shelter wood or whatever. You know, how does how does doing your thinning well prepare you then for uh, regeneration treatments? I can speak primarily to northern hardwoods, but I've seen similar effects in in mixed conifer stands of the northeast, and and I think I've seen it in oak stands as well. And it may apply to Western conifers too. Let's use Northern hardwoods. By the time these stands are uh, 60 years of age, they're producing a lot of seeds, the upper canopy trees. So we found that if we, if we intervene for our first thinning at age 70, where we get enough volume for an operable cut, then uh, the understory is brightened sufficiently that the seeds which fall and germinate stay alive. And they begin to grow. And, and in our stands, we where we have uh, mostly sugar maple with components of black cherry and white ash or yellow birch, we see that in the component of regeneration as well. By by ten years, uh, the canopy is closing, so we're beginning to see a slowing down of the height development of the this newer age class, and, and it's most pronounced in the ash and cherry, the, the trees of lower shade tolerance. So if we did another thinning, let's say at age 15, after the first, there'd still be enough vigor, primarily in sugar maple, to stimulate its growth. 
in the stands that I've seen that had been thinned repeatedly, we begin to see a buildup of age classes. If you want to go to another even age rotation, you could look at that first thinning as having an effect similar to a, a seed cutting in a shelter wood system, whereby you're developing advanced regeneration. And, and in the hardwoods and, and uh, spruce fir, at least, you never should take the overstory off until you have abundant, well developed advanced regeneration of desirable species. So uh, the, the thinnings will set you up with advanced regeneration. So when you come to the end rotation, if you do want to use clear cutting as a regeneration method, you can take the overstory off with a fair degree of confidence. We have in various places good data to show that's to be the truth. Perhaps does that speak to the question? Yes, I think it does. Um, and then here's, and I'm, so I'm kind of modifying these questions a little bit, but it's, you're, you're, they're all on track, I think. Um, how does, so you'd, you'd, you'd pointed out kind of the benefit of being at about 60% relative density from a, from a number of different, um, criteria. What are the, and, and you're going to lose production per acre if you drop below 60%. Are there other factors that would, um, what, what are the consequences? So let's say you continued to thin to the same residual basal area rather than allowing your basal area to increase with each successive cutting cycle. If you thin to a, a static basal area, your relative density would go down through time and your production per acre would go down through exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah. Are there are there other negative consequences to that? Is that from a maybe a forest I think, perspective or well I no, I don't think so. I, I think you'd have open space. Now it would though result in uh, op a more open understory. So if if say you wanted to stimulate understory production as a habitat management device for wild animals one of the things you could do is drop the basal area or the stocking down to say 55% relative density. You would lose some production, but you get a much more robust understory response. If you keep going to that static level, it's going to drop lower and lower. And, and if you have a sites where there are potential for interfering plants, then interference will build up. A an example would be uh, say on the Allegheny Plateau over in Pennsylvania, where they have uh, hay sanded and New York fern that clearly interfere with the under with the regeneration of other species, those lower densities will promote and maintain a dense understory of fern. You, you could get dense understory of striped maple or other kinds of things too. So keeping the keeping the stand at that sixty percent level of density will help in help to dampen the development of of uh, those uh, interfering plants, but it also uh, you you will if you want to have that robust understory response, then you want to go down below it. There is a recommendation that when you get to the end end of the rotation, you, if you do a, a seed cutting to begin building up that understory, then you want to drop it intentionally down to fifty five or even fifty percent relative density, and then follow through with your overstory removal once you have enough trees of desirable species of minimum size to withstand the exposure from overstory removal. Okay, very good. So I think, um, I think that pretty well covers all of those questions. Are there, we have, uh, if there's any other questions that people have, this is the time to, to uh, write them into the chat window. Um, and just to re reiterate what Rolf was saying, I have the files that he mentioned, and I will be emailing those to everyone who registered for the webinars. So you will you'll automatically get those. You don't need to contact me. Um, and I'm also preparing a blog post that will have access to all of those files. So if for some reason in the future you misplace the files, or you want to recover another copy of them, there will be a, an online location where you can go and download those. So that, that, should be, uh, that, that should be up hopefully by Friday evening. All right, so Tim has a question. Um, in the context of uneven age management, 
can the residual relative density be utilized as a guide as you expand gaps or group selections and patch clear cuts? Okay, relative density has no use at all or no relevance in uneven age stands. It, it entirely pertains to even age one. In uneven age stands, you want to reference them to some of the recommended uh, management guides uh, for uneven age silviculture. Uh, in northern hardwood, you could you could refer to Leek Solomon Philip, or you go back to the Bible, which is uh, Aaron Silka or Mar Arbogast. The work we did showed that you could you could operate selection system at different residual stocking levels from perhaps as high as 80 square feet to the acre down to 65. But as you go to lower and lower residual stocking levels, you have to extend the, the cutting cycle. So if we were to use say 65 square feet, balancing the age classes in the process, we would probably expect a 30 year cutting cycle. If we use a, 80 square feet is probably more like 15 years. So keep the balance between them. If you, if, you inter, inter, if you do single tree selection over most of the stand and insert some, some patches, then you, you have to regulate the, the diameter distribution and the density in the inter uh, patch matrix, you know, between the patches, and then uh, limit the number of patches per unit area. Uh, Stanley Phillip and, and Bill Leak uh, did a paper back in the 70s or 80s about this. Uh, uh, they initially called it patch selection, patch hyphen selection system. Uh, that's the term I've used where you use a single tree throughout and then insert these fixed area patches at uh, probably not more than two per three acres at that uh, level to sustain the stand in, uh, inf indefinitely. But you can do that uh, just. The tendency when you start cutting patches is to cut too many for sustainable management. And, and people end up, uh, uh, after two or three entries, they run out of trees to cut. So just uh, contain yourself and limit the number of patches you cut to about two every three acres. That, if you have a, a standby group that's where the age classes occur by group clusters, family groups, it's about the same thing. You really can't, you have to thin the area between the groups, but you really can't, you can't take more than uh, about two groups for every three acres. Otherwise, you just uh, overcut the stand. Okay, very good. Well, there are no more questions, Ralph. So okay. I'm going to call the webinar to a close. I want to thank you very much for preparing this presentation. This was done just for this webinar, and that's great. It's, I've learned so much. In this, Good, well, I, I had to see it twice, so that's I'm, right. I'm, 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 a, I'm a slow learner. Right. Um, but it, it'll be up on it'll be up on YouTube. Uh, I, maybe I'll get to do that tonight, and um, then people can go watch it ten or twelve times if there's well, good enough and enjoy the, <laughs> what's left of the first day of summer. That's right. Um, so thank you, Ralph, and thank you all the participants. Um, we'll see you next month, third Wednesday. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you.